Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor Goodwin. I'm the communications manager here at ProPublica, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. For those who don't know us, ProPublica is a nonprofit investigative newsroom dedicated to exposing abuses of power and betrayals of public trust by government, business, and other institutions, using the moral force of investigative journalism to spur real world impact. Last Thursday, we published an investigation that revealed that Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has accepted luxury trips from billionaire Republican donor Harlan Crow virtually every year for over 20 years without disclosing them. A number of experts we interviewed said that Thomas broke longstanding norms for judges' conduct, and several of those experts said his failure to report private jet flights appeared to violate federal disclosure laws. Thomas, for his part, issued a statement saying he'd consulted with unnamed members of the court who told him that he was not required to disclose such travel because it amounted to, quote, personal hospitality. The explosive story shook the nation, sparked national outrage, and created immediate impact. On Friday, Democratic lawmakers called for investigations and vowed to create stricter ethics rules for justices. And on Monday, yesterday, the Senate Judiciary Committee announced plans to hold a hearing in the coming days, quote, regarding the need to restore confidence in the Supreme Court's ethical standards, citing ProPublica's reporting. Joining us today is Josh Kaplan, one of the reporters behind the investigation and ProPublica editor-in-chief, Steve Engelberg. Before I hand it off to Steve, I just wanna note that we received more than 700 audience questions ahead of time. We won't be able to hit them all, but we've identified common themes and are going to try and cover as much ground as possible. If you'd like to submit a question in today's session, you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. Thanks again for joining us. I'll let Steve take it from here. You guys can turn on your cameras now. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. I'm Steve Engelberg. I am the Editor-in-Chief of ProPublica, a job I've held for the last 10 years. Um, I'd like to introduce to the audience uh, Josh Kaplan, uh, who has been a reporter with us for the last three years. Uh, joined us from, as a freelance journalist uh, and a fellow at ProPublica uh, from Washington, D.C., where he was writing a column about criminal justice for the Washington City paper. Um, he holds a degree in mathematics from the University of Chicago, which I suppose uh, may come in ha handy for some of the work that we're doing now. Um, so, Josh, tell us a little bit about how you and your partners on this story, Justin Elliott and Alex Mierski, got into this. How, how, what, what sort of got this started? Yeah, so we, um, you know, towards the end of last year, Justin and I, um, you know, we we're starting to think about ways we could cover the judiciary, and we we're casting, um, frankly, a, a probably too wide of a net. We were looking at all sorts of stories at once, and um, we were filing records requests and combing through documents, and um, there was one flight we found that caught our eye. Um, it you know, we, we found some evidence that seemed to indicate that Justice Thomas had flown on this billionaire Harlan Crow's plane from D.C. to New Haven, Connecticut, for um, what was roughly a three-hour trip. It looked like a, you know, maybe a lunchtime appointment. We weren't sure what it was. And then flew back on the jet uh, three hours later. And this seemed, I mean, potentially newsworthy in its own right, but also that, you um, it was such a short trip for a private jet flight that it suggested to us like this might be part of a habit. This might be part of a larger pattern. And uh, we started really digging in. So tell us a little bit about, I know many people on this uh, uh, conference have, have read the article, but just tell us a little bit, what were the high points of, as things began to unfold, what were the sort of high points of what you found? Yeah, so we found, um, I mean, the extent and frequency of what we found was was really surprising to us. So we found that Justice Thomas has been accepting these luxury trips from Harlan Crow virtually every year for 20 years. And that includes uh, flights on Crow's large private jet. That includes international cruises on a super yacht, um, regular vacations at his luxury resort in the Adirondacks. Um, you know, one of the more recent examples we found, um, you know, just one example was in uh, 2019, Justice Thomas flew to Indonesia uh, on Crow's private jet and then spent nine days island hopping with him on a super yacht staffed by a private chef and a host of stewardesses. Um, and, you know, we were told that 
if Thomas had chartered the plane and the yacht himself, uh, the cost could have exceeded $500,000 for that trip. How do you report a story like that? Who do you, who do you talk to? I mean, they clearly are not an um, enormous number of documents. So how do, you, how do you think about finding information out about something like that? Yeah, I mean, kind of the remarkable, something I hadn't fully appreciated until we were, were deep into this is that to live um, this luxuriously, you have a lot of people involved in kind of mundane aspects of your life. Um, you know, if I was to take you on United Air and we rented, a, you know, rooms in a nice hotel in Paris, it'd be really hard to find. Um, but, you know, Crow has staff on his yacht. Crow has, you know, he has staff at his uh, private resort. He has all sorts of staff involved in coordinating, um, you know, different aspects of his life. And so we talked to, we just started making calls and we, you know, had a spreadsheet of a few hundred names and, uh, you know, talked to dozens of people from, um, you know, the staff on his yacht to members of the Bohemian Grove to, you know, an Indonesian scuba diving instructor who <laughs> spent time on Crow's uh, yacht while Thomas was there. Fascinating. And, and I'm sure people talk to people so word gets around. Um, and then there were some social media things I, I gather that proved helpful. Uh, yes, um, we, um, you know, once we would, you know, had some inkling that Thomas might have gone to, you know, X location around X time, we started um, scrubbing through all sorts of social media. I mean, or another instance was, you know, we were staring at a photo we had of Harlan Crow in Indonesia. and. Um, we noticed that Harlan Crow was wearing a polo shirt that said, had the the logo of his yacht and then said Indonesia, um, summer 2019 or something like that. And we're like, does he make shirts for all of the trips? And we asked, uh, his, you know, some people we've been talking to and they're like, uh, yeah, he often does. And so we went down this rabbit hole of trying to find as many photos of Clarence Thomas as we could. And ultimately, you know, found a photo of him wearing one of these shirts um, at what seemed like a tech conference, maybe. But it said Greek Islands, March 2007, which was a trip we didn't know anything about until then. Fascinating. I guess in the modern world, it's hard to move around without people noticing you or photographing you, particularly if you're famous. So... You go at some point, you do your reporting, you look at the official disclosure forms that every justice files, um, and you look start looking for this these trips. Uh, are they there? None of them were. None of the trips we found uh, were disclosed by Justice Thomas. So that raises, raises an interesting question. I know with ProPublica, we have a, a, a policy we're very proud of that we we notify people well before a story comes out what we're going to say. We call it a no surprises letter. We don't want anyone to ever be surprised by what they read about themselves or, frankly, anything that's important to them or their friends. So we do that as a matter of course. So you and your colleagues sent a no surprises letter to Thomas, asking him to explain this. What, what did he say back? Well, so before we published, um, we sent him detailed questions and followed up repeatedly, and, and he didn't... Um, respond to this. Um, after we published, um, uh, he he released a statement, which is actually uh, fairly rare for Justice Thomas, um, in which he said that, you know, Crow was a, a dear friend of his. And he said that early in his career, he'd asked um, some of his colleagues, uh, you know, about the disclosure rules, and they'd suggested to him that, you know, because uh, Crow was a friend, and uh, he didn't have business be directly before the court that this was okay and that he didn't need to disclose it. So sort of like a kind of hospitality exemption, right? If you have a, a college friend and you go stay in their house for the weekend, you don't have to disclose the value of that stay. Right, and there's a, there is a, there's a personal hospitality exemption in the law, it, um, in the disclosure law, which is a, a ethics law that was passed after Watergate, requires Supreme Court justices and many other government officials to disclose most gifts. It appears Thomas might have been referencing that, but you know, after he released this statement, we went to you know seven different ethics law experts, including former ethics lawyers for Congress and for the White House, 
And all of them told us that the law clearly required that he disclose things like these private jet flights. And that if he is arguing that they were, um, that they were exempt from disclosure uh, because they were personal hospitality, that he's incorrect on, on what the law requires. Well, let me ask you a question. Neither one of us, neither you nor I, Josh, are, are constitutional lawyers, um, nor would we play them on TV. But, I mean, this is a law passed by the legislative branch and signed by the president's president. I mean, so does how does one branch tell another branch what to do? Does this law really apply to the Supreme Court, as far as we know? Um, as far as we know, Yes, in the sense, it, but it's an interesting, it's an important and interesting question. So the the um, the law explicitly says that it applies to Supreme Court justices. And since it's been passed, Supreme Court justices have been filing the disclose, the annual financial disclosures that are required by the law. Um, however, there is potentially a larger constitutional issue at play here. So in 2011, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts um, uh, in an annual report talked about how there was some chatter at the time of there being more laws passed by Congress. And Chief Justice Roberts said that the question has never been addressed as to whether Congress has the ability to impose rules on the Supreme Court. And he acknowledged that there were some rules that they and said that uh, the justices had been complying with them. But he seemed he raised the question um, of whether this was actually something that they would be required to do if if that uh, if the law was challenged, and also if Congress had the power to impose more rules, which I think is you know very uh, germane to our current moment. Right, very much in the air now. Well, let's go back a little bit. So Clarence Thomas comes on the court in 1991. Many of us will recall fairly controversial hearings um, before the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, then chaired by uh, Senator Joe Biden. Um, he is confirmed. Um, when did he and, and, and Harlan Crowe cross paths? And, and who is Harlan Crowe? Yeah, so they met a few years after Justice Thomas went on the court. And Harlan Crowe is a um, real estate tycoon based in Dallas. Uh, he um, you know, is an heir to his father's real estate fortune, and he has been you know, an enormously successful um, businessman overseeing um, kind of his family's business, uh, real estate and investment empire. Um, and he's also a, um, a major and influential figure in conservative politics. He's um, long been a, a, a major Republican donor. He's given over $10 million in disclosed political contributions. And he's also uh, given to dark money groups. Um, exactly how much and exactly to who um, you know, is, is not fully known. But what we do know is that he has given um, millions of dollars to you know, ideological efforts to uh, shape the law and the judiciary and move them further to the right. So you know, one group that he's uh, donated to that I think many people on this call will know is the Federalist Society. Um, he also you know, sits on the boards of, of uh, major pro-business think tanks that you know, have scholars that um, advance specific conservative legal theories um, and who occasionally file amicus briefs with the Supreme Court. So you mentioned uh, uh, the 2011 and John Roberts, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts writing um, you know, this uh, uh, paper that was you know, sort of circulated at the time in, in regard to questions. I mean, in fact, weren't some of those questions also at that point uh, in 2011 being raised by what had been revealed about Thomas in that year? Uh, yes. So, I mean, Roberts does not specifically, um, me he does not mention Thomas uh, in this in this writing, but a lot of court observers think that's what he was responding to. So in 2011, uh, the New York Times and Politico had a, a series of articles that were kind of the first real revelations of the close ties between um, Justice Thomas and Harlan Crow. Uh, Politico had reported that um, Crow had given a, um, I believe, a five hundred thousand dollar donation uh, to a Tea Party group that Thomas's wife had founded, and which also paid her uh, uh, one hundred twenty thousand dollars salary. And then the Times um, kind of. Uh, Went through disclosures that uh, that you know he had he had disclosed but had never really been you know put in one place or examined or made sense of and also uh, you know uh, revealed that he had um, 
the crow had given half a million dollars, I think, yeah, half a million dollars to fund what was essentially a pet project of Thomas's uh, to create a museum um, in the uh, town he grew up in. That's, that's fascinating. So in one way, this was really on the sort of public record um, a while ago. Um, and the disclosure statements contain some information that became controversial. Did, did his disclosure statements continue to be uh, detailed um, in any way at all? Was there anything on them after 2011? Or what happened? Yeah, I mean, so so Thomas used to be a lot more, uh, used to disclose a lot more uh, back in the 90s, actually. In, in the 90s, he, actually, he once disclosed uh, a private jet flight from Crow um, to the Bohemian Grove in California. Um, and when you would, when these disclosures would get released to the public, newspapers would write about it. And by around, you know, 2000, 2004 ish, he, for the most part, stopped disclosing things. He, um, I think, recently, like in the last five, seven years, disclosed um, a gift, like a, a physical gift from Crow. It was, uh, I believe, a, a bust of Frederick Douglass. But in terms of these, these vacations, the travel, um, that has uh, completely been absent from his, um, his, his required reports to the public. We're gonna say you into some audience questions. One of the audience questions is about the experts we consulted and the member of the audience asked, uh, were they uh, just Democrats? Were they Republicans and Democrats? What were the political leanings of the folks uh, that you and the team spoke with? Yeah, we spoke with experts who'd served in both you know, Republican and, and Democratic uh, administrations. Um, some of them were, you know, career ethics officials who'd served in both. Uh, one, for instance, was uh, George W. Bush's, um, uh, the White House's chief, uh, chief, ethic, chief ethics lawyer during the Bush administration. Um, so we tried to, we tried to um, ask as, as wide a variety of people as we could, who also had the kind of experience um, to, you know, to have be in a place to have thought carefully about the law and understand it um, rigorously. Uh, one thing I want to just go back to for a moment and sort of the the ethical um, you know constructs around this. We've talked a lot about the uh, post Watergate federal law that requires all federal officials at a certain level to disclose aspects of their personal business and so on. Um, what about judges? Are judges covered by anything? And 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 how does that work? Yeah, so so judges are covered by the same disclosure laws. Um, they also have another document, and it's called the the Judiciary's Code of Conduct, and this this covers every federal judge um, below the Supreme Court. And there are um, you know some kind of specific practical um, rules or principles that are laid out around questions like recusal, when must a judge recuse themselves from a case. And there's also, um, this is where um, a lot of the, the lofty, broader ethical norms and standards for the judiciary are, judiciary are articulated. So there, there, um, there's a lot of language in there requiring judges to, for instance, avoid even the appearance of impropriety um, and to you know, conduct themselves at all times in a way that promotes uh, public confidence in their integrity and their independence. And this is, you know, uh, an enforceable document that um, there is there is an administrative apparatus within the within the judiciary um, that can um, uh, take disciplinary action if if a judge is uh, found to have violated the code. Um, this this it explicitly does not apply to the Supreme Court. However, the Supreme Court, uh, Roberts has said that the justices do consult this document for guidance. He, he isn't saying that they this is irrelevant to their behavior. Yeah, now we get a very interesting question from an audience member who uh, was listening to a podcast put up by our colleagues at Slate, who notes that uh, correctly that the travel policy for high level judges, although not the Supreme Court, um, was changed shortly before the release of the ProPublica article and the Chief Justice John Roberts sits on the board that sets the policy. Um, and the question is, why was that not, and has that not been um, a big story? Um, uh, and I will remind listeners just before we get into that, that 
uh, remember that this document, even if Roberts is involved, uh, th these policies do not apply to the Supreme Court. So this is the, uh, the Judicial Conference changing rules for all the judges except the Supreme Court. But talk a little bit about why wasn't that a big deal at the time? We're talking about the financial, the changes in the financial disclosure rules. Yeah, and maybe you could go a little bit into what changed because it, it did seem, um, I think, coincidentally, as if um, the uh, the people making the new rules might have anticipated this because the rules specifically address travel questions. So, what did they change, and why wasn't that much of a story at the time? Yeah, I mean, there there was some coverage of it. I mean, and I should say the, the the these financial disclosure guidelines do apply to justices because they are required to um, file financial disclosures. It, it's a yes. bit of a separate thing from the the ethical, you know, the the broader ethical codes that apply to lower court judges. Um, and what this what this update did is, um, you know made explicit things that had um, basically laid out more specific scenarios as to when disclosure is required and when disclosure isn't. And there was some genuine ambiguity uh, in the judiciary uh, until this update happened around questions like, um, you know, corporate ownership. Um, you know, if I go to a, uh, if I go to, you know, a resort that if I'm a justice and I go to a resort that you own, um, you know, how do I determine if this is something that I have to disclose or something that, um, you know, because I, because you're the one that's offering it to me and you own the resort, uh, I can go there for I can go there for free and not let the public know about it. And so clarify questions like that. It also but also I think there's been some some things lost in translation um, around this update. Um, so, you know. All the ethics law experts we talked to did say that transportation has clearly always been required for judges, um, for for judges and justices to disclose it, um, and that includes private jet flights or cruises on a yacht. Um, and the law hasn't changed. Um, and this update did say that you know it, it makes this explicit, but um, everyone we've talked to, all the lawyers we've talked to have said there is really never an interpretation of this that would lead you to uh, conclude otherwise, even before the recent update. So to state it in sort of plain language, um, uh, you know, someday I retire and um, uh, I have a, I have a, I decide uh, that I'm going to go out and play the lottery. I win the lottery. I decide to buy a mansion in Hawaii. And um, I invite one of the justices out. If I send them the plane ticket, that's a problem, isn't it? Yes. Can't do that. Yes. Um, theoretically, if I own my my estate that I bought with my lottery winnings, um, if they fly out there on their own, um, potentially it's not a disclosable event. Although I should say it's not a problem, actually. That, that's a, a kind of a funny segue in that um, if they if you send them their plane ticket and they don't disclose it, that's a problem. However, there really are very, very few restrictions on what justices can accept. Um, so, if Thomas had done everything that we we uh, that we uh, if, if if Thomas's vacations were exactly the same, he went on these extremely extravagant, very regular trips around the world, flying on a private jet, going on a super yacht, staying at a luxury resort, and he disclosed all of it. This would be completely uh, within the uh, within the guidelines of the rules and laws governing Supreme Court justices, and that's a really stark contrast to the other branches of government. Um, you know, if you look at members of Congress, for instance, they're generally prohibited from accepting a gift from anyone um, that's worth more than fifty dollars. Um, and you know, there's some exceptions, but to take a trip like this, even from a you know a close personal friend. Um, they need to get uh, formal pre-approval from uh, an ethics committee. Well, and in fact, this came up in your reporting, didn't it? We, we have uh, published in the story, for those who have seen it, um, a, a photorealist painting of Clarence Thomas at, at Harlan Crow's um, you know, Adirondacks uh, Resort. And, and it's, a, it's a really quite, quite realistic painting of five people sitting around. One of those people... Uh, is a former Thomas law clerk named uh, Mark Poloni, I believe that is, right? Paletta. Paletta, I'm sorry, Mark Paletta. 
And uh, Mr. Paletta, you, inter you, you interviewed him about all this. What did he do when he was offered? And he was at the time working in the White House, right? What did he do when he was offered the chance to do to visit this for free? Yeah, so we had an email exchange with uh, with Mr. Pauletta, um actually about his. He was also on the Indonesia trip. Um, he mm -hmm. was there with Justice Thomas, and we and he, you know, we we got his financial disclosure because he was at the time um, a lawyer in the Trump administration, and he hadn't disclosed it. So we went to him um, and asked him why, um, and he told us that you know when he when uh, when Crow invited him on this trip, he went to his agency's ethics council, um, and they told him. Um, that you know he would need to reimburse Mr. Crow for this, and so he did. So that's pretty clear. It's an executive branch official. He can't accept a gift um, from somebody who might have um, you know business before the federal government. He has to pay for it himself. Is there any real purpose? I mean, I think you know one of the things we try to think hard about at ProPublic is why do people do the things they do? It helps us, I think, write um, sympathetically and, and effectively about them. Is there a good reason why the Supreme Court would have a different set of rules um, that you could that you've come across in your reporting? Why why is it this way? Um, it's an excellent question. I mean, I think part of it might have to do with the level of scrutiny the court has had over the years, because frankly, you know, these 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 harsher restrictions that the other branches of government have didn't come out of nowhere. They didn't just right. decide like, okay, the law requires us to do this, but we're going to go above and beyond. And, you know, members of Congress aren't going to take gifts that are worth more than 50 bucks. You know, the really, the strict laws in Congress, for instance, came, uh, followed the Jack uh, Abramoff scandal, which yep. uh, as people may remember, involved a lobbyist that was giving all sorts of perks to, uh, to members of Congress. And, you know, after that happened, uh, they really, uh, they really impose stricter rules. Um, and so I think it may simply be that um, I, I can't speculate to why the court hasn't taken um, taken this uh, upon themselves, but they haven't have had the level of, of scrutiny or the level of scandal of some of the other branches. And so maybe had uh, you know less reason to feel they needed to tighten down. Well, certainly up until recent years, the Supreme Court, I think, has consistently been of the three branches, the the, in polling, the most respected, the most popular um, uh, Congress uh, for many years now being very low in the ratings and, and the White House uh, pretty low in the court until I think the last two or three years, um, always by far the most respected. Um, several folks asked questions uh, of us, uh, Josh, which I guess we should both respond to. Um, are we aware of the Wall Street Journal editorial? And what do we say to this uh, argument that it's all a big smear? Um, I'll certainly let you answer that. I might have a thought or two myself. Um, we thought these were really important facts to get um, before the public and that they would help inform the public conversation about the Supreme Court and uh, what we should expect of, of justice's conduct. Um, and I, I think it has sparked that conversation. I mean, to the you know notion that it's a it's a politically motivated. I mean, I I I, I don't. I, I would like to emphasize that, you know, for me and Justin and Alex, that was, uh, we didn't go out looking for what we could find on Justice Thomas. We went out looking for, uh, you know, started researching Supreme Court justices, and we found that uh, a lot of these gifts uh, for Thomas, and so we went in that direction. And um, we're still very much interested in the topic. Um, and we're going to keep reporting. Uh, I, I should say that if, if anyone on this call happens to have any information we should know about any justice, um, we would be uh, extremely, extremely eager to hear from you. Yeah, perhaps our colleague Connor can put in the chat uh, a, way, a way to reach us uh, with that kind of information. Um, and, and I would just add as editor, when I heard uh, and was interested in the subject of going, you know, covering the judiciary more closely, um, one of the initial thoughts I had uh, turned to not only the 2011 uh, New York Times story on Thomas, but also more recent work by the Wall Street Journal, very fine work um, on the uh, federal district judges who theoretically have a tighter regimen and were nonetheless um, deciding a lot of cases in which they had some personal financial interests. And so um, that certainly made me want to uh, know more about uh, the judiciary. And uh, when the team came to us and had this focus on the Supreme Court, it seemed to me to make a good sense 
Um, number one, it's the highest court in the land. And number two, um, from a journalistic perspective, it had seemed to have been a little bit less examined of late. And so um, that's what motivated us. This was not, um, you know, people, you know, I, I've seen the tweets and so on about, uh, I mean, I've seen actually some interesting tweets on both sides. On 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 the on the right, um, there are people who said, "Well, this is clearly aimed at Thomas, who's a, a leader of originalism, and and, and ProPublica is trying to take that down," which which clearly has nothing to do with anything uh, in our coverage. Uh, and then some other people, frankly, saying on the left, "Well, would ProPublica uh, cover this if the names were George Soros and Elena Kagan?" And let me assure you, we will. Um, so again, I would to, love to write that story. Yes, if, if anyone on this call knows anything about anybody, uh, you know, uh, on on any side of the Supreme Court that has been um, in arrangements like this, this is we think uh, worthy of putting before the public in in a very factual way, and that's what we tried to. The tone of the story was to try to be um, as as factual as possible. Um, I had an interesting question here, Josh, um, and you have already in, in your in your relatively young career done a lot of really fascinating things, Josh. Uh, worked on a, a quite amazing story uh, on our departure from Afghanistan, interviewing um, soldiers who survived the blast in one of the last days of the war in Kabul. So you've already had your share of big stories, but one of the uh, people on this call asked, Josh, what was it like for you as a journalist a person working on this story? When did it get excited? When did you know you were exciting? When did you know you were onto a big scoop that would make a stir? Oh, this is good. Did your editors make you double check certain facts? Oh, uh, they didn't have to. We we uh, we quadruple checked um, all the facts in our story. Um, but yes, I mean it was, um, I mean it was a really satisfying uh, reporting process because um, we kind of had this continual stream of new stuff coming in um, and things we had to ultimately leave on the cutting room floor. I mean it was, you know. Uh, you know, early on, we were looking um, a lot at Camp Topridge and learning how often, um, you know, Thomas had been going there and what it was like and what happened while he was there. Um, and then suddenly, you know, we start hearing about the yacht and start digging in um, on that side. Um, so uh, I, I don't think there was like any one moment. Um, uh, we always found it was, you know, even when it, uh, in retrospect, things that seem, you know, were, were 2,000 words down in our story felt remarkable when we found them. And then uh, it kept kind of ballooning. Isn't that really typical of the process of, a, of any good investigative story, right? You don't, I mean, one of the things that happens is you you don't really know where you're going. Um, I think when, when the, you guys started this, we had no notion of what we would find. Um, and that's kind of why this is one of the greatest careers you could ever have. Yeah, no, it's there's nothing more fun than uh, talking to people who know a lot more than you do and uh, trying to get washed away wherever the facts end up going. A lot of people have asked about, and we did have a line in the story about this, um, you know, that this was seemingly without precedent. And we're always, I, I will share with our audience, we're, we're always very nervous in that kind of uh, uh, writing in 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 in. in uh, in the world of journalism, because, you know, I'm a former New York Times report employee, basically a reporter and editor, the word unique is essentially banned at the New York Times, because the minute you say something is unique, somebody calls you up and says, no, it's not. Um, but we we did feel that we could say, as far as we could tell, this was without precedent. I mean, has any other Supreme Court justice in history, other than Thomas, been caught up in anything that looks like this? Yeah, I mean, th there are a number of scandals, um, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and we, you know, we felt that, the, you know, what we decided to say is that the the extent and frequency um, of these gifts going from Crow to Thomas uh, was unprecedented in the court's modern history. But, you know, I mean, I think probably the mo most noteworthy one in the last, um, you know, 60 odd years uh, is uh, Abe Fortas, um, who was a uh, Supreme Court Justice, um, who in the late 60s, I believe it may have been the early 70s, um, ultimately had to resign um, because he was receiving a he received a $20,000 retainer uh, from an organization tied to a friend of his. Um, and the retainer was was set up such that it was going to give him an annual payment uh, every year for the rest of his life. Um, and he ultimately um, this friend of his got caught up in insider trading scandal. Um, 
And Fortas ultimately returned the money. And when that case made its way up to the court, he recused himself from the case. But the outcry from uh, lawmakers, uh, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, was such that he uh, ultimately felt he had to resign. Right. Now, one interesting thing about that, and I can assure our listeners, this is not the case in ProPublica's work. We don't talk about our sources, but I do want to, we've, we've been clear about this from the beginning. I mean, in that particular case, uh, by then, uh, Republican President, uh, President Nixon was in office, um, and the Nixon administration was aware of this scandal involving the $20,000 payment, which had not been public knowledge, and they uh, work closely with a magazine, Look Magazine, to help uh, make sure that this became publicly known. Um, and so you certainly could make an argument, um, now that we have all the Nixon tapes and some of the records from that period, uh, that the Nixon administration was trying to force out a democratically appointed, LBJs had appointed Fortas, and Fortas was a close, close friend of LBJs. Uh, they were trying to force him uh, out and potentially change the composition of the court. Um, you know, again, it's not typical that we would comment on, uh, on uh, you know, on sources and, and methods of how we do things, but I just want to assure people on this call, this is nothing like that. This is not um, the origins of this story at all. And I think it's important that, that people know that. Um, this, is, this is the uh, result of, uh, as you're hearing, uh, the, the, what we would call the investigative method, um, having um, somewhat um, unlimited time, not entirely unlimited, but somewhat unlimited time, and and space to, to really dig into things and try to learn things that, um, that maybe nobody knew. Let's talk a little bit briefly in the time we have left, Josh. One of the questions that certainly came up for us, and I know it's come up for the public, how confident can we be that um, this relationship is, um, as it's been described, Harlan Crow says uh, the Thomases are, are dear friends uh, and vice versa. Um, and that he has nothing before the court of, of any interest. I mean, how do we know that? Can we be certain of that? I mean, I think there's a lot unknown about the relationship still. Um, I mean, Crow, you know, we, we talked to people who know both men and uh, they told us they have become genuine friends. Um, but, you know, they've spent a, a lot of time together over the years in um, private or relatively private places all over the world. And, um, we basically we know very very little about uh, what they've discussed or whether you know Crow has had some influence on Thomas's views, whether you know directly or indirectly. Um, you know, Crow told us that they've never discussed a pending case, um, and that he's never sought to influence uh, Justice Thomas. But I, mean, I think this, you know. Uh, a lot of the, you know, you talk to political scientists, they'll tell you about, um, you know, how the people you associate with and spend time with have, you know, inevitably have um, an influence on your views. Um, and I think this broader question of how this relationship or if this relationship that spans um, decades um, has impacted Thomas is, is um, very much still a live one. What about, and we don't really know much about this, what about other people that he could have um, interacted with, uh, unbeknownst even to Harlan Crow. I mean, as I understand it, that private plane had um, more than two or three seats on it, right? How, how many people were on a trip like that, and what kind of people were they? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Crow not only has this access to Justice Thomas, but that access extends to kind of anyone else he chooses to invite along on these trips. And so, um, I mean, Topridge is kind of the, the easiest example to look at. It's this, this resort that um, is guests don't pay, it's invitation only, Crow owns it. And, you know, we've found, uh, you know, Thomas has been up there uh, with uh, Leonard Leo, the leader of the Federalist Society, who a lot of people kind of regard as a, a principal architect of um, the Supreme Court's turn to the right in recent years. Um, you know, in one trip in, in 2017, uh, we, we learned um, Thomas's other guests uh, that week included, you know, executives at, you know, uh, Verizon and PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is the, the accounting giant, um, major Republican donors, um, one of the leaders of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, influential conservative think tank. Um, so we, we certainly don't have a full picture of who all has joined these trips over the years, but um, and we have no uh, 
you have no evidence that anything untoward happened with those tra uh, with with these other people. You know, Crow told us um, that you know, to his knowledge, no one's tried to lobby or influence Thomas, and they wouldn't any invite anyone who he thought might. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question of you know who you know who who is in this milieu and and what is the impact of that on Thomas Ben? Right. I mean, in a sense, unless until and unless which I don't expect would happen, um, that um, Thomas were to, or the court were to disclose um, more details about who was on these trips and so on, um, it's going to be pretty hard to know whether somebody uh, who was in proximity to the justice uh, yes. had a case. Um, I mean, we should point out that there are many, many, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of court cases filed all over the country. And I think the Supreme Court grants cert in, in what, about 200. So it's it's a small, uh, a small number to be sure, um, but it's not nothing, and it's incredibly influential. Um, all right, well, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I think one question that somebody wanted to ask was, um, Jenny Thomas, of course, has been much in the news uh, uh, with the revelations post uh, January 6th about um, her, her role in uh, you know, contesting and protesting, sending even emails to state legislators about the election outcomes. Um, does Ginny Thomas typically go with Clarence Thomas on these trips? Does he go by himself, or what do we know about that? Uh, for m most of the ones that we, um, I mean, I guess we don't have a full picture, but yes, she often or uh, is on these trips with Justice Thomas. Um, she was in Indonesia. She's been at Topridge with him. Um, there's a, a kind of a long history of, of Thomas and his wife and uh, Harlan Crow and and his wife all traveling together to to places around the world, which you know is not surprising. I mean, no, not you know, surprising at all. Clearly, um, the justices' calendar is such that they do work very hard for a period of the year, and then there's a period of the year where things are a little quieter. So I can understand uh, that he and his wife would would take these trips. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to thank everybody for all their questions. This has really been, um, uh, they've been flooding in here um, and I've been trying to uh, deal with them as quickly as we can and as, as broadly as we can. I, I did want to sort of close with a little question, just, you know, you're, you're new to this, but it is a question I think that everybody has, has wondered about. We saw uh, the Democrats in the Senate, Dick Durbin in particular, putting out a statement saying that, that they expected that they would want to legislate about this, that there may be, you know, coming from the Congress, a Supreme Court code of ethics. Uh, it might have some enforcement mechanisms. I don't know, an ethics officer maybe. Um, what do you think? Is that possible? Do you think that's going to happen? Or is that uh, is that really a, a kind of a dream here? I don't know. I mean, it's, there's, you know, there's been some talk, there have been bills floated about this for, for a while now. Um, and this uh, certainly is, is the most uh, momentum and concerted action I've seen uh, toward uh, imposing new rules on the court um, in a long time. Um, you know, uh, you have people like Dick Durbin, you know, vowing to act um, and calling this reporting a, a call to action. Um, so far, uh, nothing has, has, there's been no real concrete steps in that direction. Um, you know, they've also demanded that Justice Roberts uh, investigate, uh, lawmakers have, uh, whether or not that, uh, you know, whether or not he intends to do so is, is still unclear. Um, so, I mean, you know, there've been, there've been, uh, there've been, you know, various kind of controversies around the court for a long time now, and there haven't been, um, major ethical reforms, uh, since the late seventies. Um, but, uh, I think it remains to be seen. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I'll maybe close out here and just say that, you know, somebody who's started off very early in his career covering the Supreme Court for the Dallas Morning News and, and, and being a sort of great fan of it. Um, I am I am skeptical that they will accept this, but I think one of the things we all know about journalists is that they're really terrible predictors of the future. And so um, I, I'm not going to contradict you, Josh, because uh, it, you know things can change, um, and and we all of the stuff we cover uh, is is testament to that. So I'd like to thank you for your time, um, and while you're still working on this uh, interesting and exciting story, and uh, thank our audience for joining us.